Hello, my name is Cliff Goodwin, and I welcome you here today for Preaching the Gospel. As you can see, I have my Bible open before me, and I want to invite you to take your Bible down at home and open it with me so that we might study the Word of God together. Today, I invite you to open your Bible, particularly to John chapter 4. John 4, and we'll begin reading at about verse 19 here in just a moment. If I may, let me lay some groundwork leading up to this passage. We remember that in John chapter 4, our Lord and His disciples have come through or have come into the area of Samaria. And there in this particular region, Jesus now is at the well there outside of the city of Sychar, if you will, and he initiates a conversation with a Samaritan woman. This he does by simply requesting a drink of her from the well, from the water, of course, that would come from the well. Now, our Lord here, he has initiated this conversation, and it proceeds. Uh, it begins about verse 7, and it will proceed all the way down through where we're picking up at verse 19. But if you were to read this passage, this context at home, you would be impressed with the manner in which our Lord spoke with the woman and the manner with which he piqued her interest, her curiosity, you might say. And in verse 19, when we pick up reading, our Lord has really brought her interest to a high point because he has already mentioned to her about going and uh, bringing her husband, calling her husband and coming back to see Jesus. Well, in verse uh, 19, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. In other words, when Jesus showed that he knew something about her life's history, he knew something about her marital status, he knew something uh, about the relationships she had been in, she perceived in verse 19 that he was a prophet. Well, verse 20, she immediately then goes into a burning question. It was a question of the day, if you will. She said, Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and ye say, you Jewish people say, that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, and now is, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and this is actually the verse that reads, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, dear friends and viewers, I've entitled our study today simply this, What Jesus Said About True Worship what Jesus said about true worship. And as you can see already with me, especially if you're looking into your Bible at home, we're going to be able to take our thoughts from this context. John chapter 4, the dialogue, the conversation involving Jesus and this unnamed Samaritan woman. And Jesus tells us a lot in this conversation about true worship. And so what I would like for us to do for the balance of our time is I would like for us to consider three or four, we might call them simply takeaways, three or four takeaways involving true worship that we take away quite literally from our Lord's words and from His teaching on this subject at this particular moment in time. 
So that being said, let's get right into the first of these takeaways. Number one, we need to realize from the words of Jesus that there are people who do not understand true worship. That's the takeaway that we can see or glean from this conversation. The woman here, the burning question of the day is, are the Samaritans worshiping properly by worshiping as they did at Mount Gerizim? Or are the Jews worshiping properly, worshiping as they did at the temple there in the city of Jerusalem? This was a hot topic of the day. And yet our Lord proceeded to tell the woman, really in verse 22, very pointedly, that ye, or you and your people, the Samaritan people, ye worship, ye know not what. Verse 22 is where Jesus said that. Ye worship, ye know not what. And so point number one that we can see clearly established is that there are people who do not understand true worship. Now, if they do not understand true worship, number one, consider with me under this, the result that's happening. And the result is if they're worshiping God without the proper understanding of true worship, well, then that means that they are worshiping ignorantly. The word ignorant, perhaps in the ears of some, it sounds like an ugly term, there's actually nothing ugly intended by the word ignorant or ignorantly. All that word means is simply without knowledge, lacking knowledge, not knowing about any particular matter. And so in this relationship or in this subject, rather, we're talking about true worship. And so if people are worshiping ignorantly, all that we're pointing out is, is that they lack knowledge pertaining to this subject. They lack knowledge pertaining to true worship. Now, that made me think about Romans 10 and verse 3, where we read from the pen of the Apostle Paul, he said, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. There in Romans 10, 3, the apostle, of course, is referring to the unbelieving Jews. They were ignorant. They did not know and understand God's plan of righteousness, how that that involved Jesus Christ. In fact, it centered upon Jesus Christ, his necessary death, atoning for the sin of the world, his victorious resurrection. The unbelieving Jews of the first century, as far or just like unbelievers still today of all nationalities, they are ignorant of God's righteousness. They, they don't fully understand what God intended and what God put into place. Now, that ignorance is exacerbated or it's made much worse when man then in turn begins to go about to establish his own righteousness, his own plan, his, his own understanding, his own way of doing things, well, that's never good. That, that is substituting what God would have man to learn, substituting that and taking in its place uh, my own system, my own contriving, if you will, of a plan whereby I can be saved. Remember when Jesus said in Matthew 15 and verse 9, he said, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So result number one is ignorance. When men and women do not understand true worship, as it is taught and revealed in the Bible, well, then the result is ignorant worship. They, they often begin worshiping God in an unauthorized manner, and that's because they're ignorant of God's requirements. Now, we learn from Matthew 15, 9, that such worship is vain inasmuch as it employs the commandments and the doctrines of men. 
how important it is when it comes to our religion and particularly to the practice of our worship, how important it is that we do not rely on the commandments or the doctrines, the teachings of men, but instead we insist on scriptural teaching. We insist on book, chapter, and verse, as it were, and uh, we won't substitute anything else in its place. Now, we've noticed the ignorance of worshiping God in a manner that is not biblical. Number two now, let's talk about how to overcome that. We've realized that there were people in Jesus' day who did not understand true worship. Sadly, the, the reality is still in our day, there are countless masses of people who do not understand true worship. The result of this misunderstanding is, number two, ignorant worship, worship that is not pleasing to God. So now number three, as we reason our way through this, how is man to overcome that? How is man to overcome uh, ignorant worship? And the answer is only by means of teaching or instruction. Teaching instruction is vital to man's avoiding or overcoming ignorant worship. Let me refer you back to the Great Commission as it is recorded by Matthew, Matthew 28, beginning at verse 19. Jesus said to the apostles, he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. But then notice verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now think about that. Part of the disciple-making process, if you will, was that the apostles and those, for that matter, who have followed after them, we are to teach people all things whatsoever Jesus had taught and had revealed unto the apostles. Well, obviously, all things would include what is necessary for proper worship. Even as Jesus began broaching that subject and, and covering that subject very basically here in John 4 with the Samaritan woman. And so the instruction of Scripture, teaching from Scripture, is absolutely vital if man is to avoid or overcome the sin of ignorant worship. One more passage along these lines, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15, the Bible tells us, Paul told his readers, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Notice how these traditions are contrasted with the traditions we read about in Matthew 15, for example. In Matthew 15, those were human traditions, the doctrines of men. And there Jesus said that such teachings render man's worship vain, empty or useless, if you will. But in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15, those traditions are inspired traditions given from an inspired apostle, in that case, the apostle Paul, and given whether by word, his oral preaching and teaching to them when he was in Thessalonica, as we have record in Acts chapter 17, or epistle. The, the writings that he sent to those brethren, two of which we have, the first and second Thessalonian epistles, have been preserved by God for us. And so the point is, is that God's word is the standard. God's word is the guide for man's worship. How is man to avoid ignorant worship? He must be taught God's word. He must become knowledgeable in God's Word, and that's how the Thessalonians did it, 
That's how the Christians in the first century did it. All of them collectively were to do it in the same manner. And that's how you and I today, if we would be pleasing to God, that's how we would learn about true worship today. And that is directly from the instruction and the teaching of the Bible. Now, let's move on to a second consideration that we can take away here, as it were, from our Lord's conversation with this Samaritan woman. Number two, we learn that true worship is tied to salvation. And then further in this point, we learn that salvation is tied to an exclusive group. Now, I've already emphasized verse 22, but revisit verse 22 with me here. Jesus told the woman very pointedly, very candidly, ye worship, ye know not what. You know, I've often thought about how in our day and time that would have been very politically incorrect for our Lord to say. In other words, you and your people, the Samaritan people, you worship, you, do, you know not what. You don't know, you don't understand what you're doing in your worship. Some would say, well, that, that's offensive or that could have offended this woman. Well, the truth of the matter is it was the truth. It was something the woman needed to hear. It was something the woman needed to wrestle with in the sense of learning from it and, and being enlightened by it, so to speak. She needed to hear this. She needed to learn this. And so we see number one in this point, point number two, first part of it, that true worship is tied to salvation. Jesus says, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Again, very politically incorrect for Jesus to tie salvation to an exclusive group. But that's exactly what he did. He's talking here with a Samaritan woman, and he says, look, you and your people, you're worshiping in ignorance. You, you don't understand true worship. You're not offering true worship. But Jesus says that's not surprising because salvation is of the Jews. It's not of the Samaritans. Salvation is tied to the Jews at that point, of course, in time. Now, let's break down this second point. True worship is tied to salvation. Salvation is tied to an exclusive group. Let's break that down in halves and deal with each part separately. First of all, do we see elsewhere in Scripture the Bible's teaching that salvation is tied to a person's worship? And the answer is yes. Consider with me Hebrews 11 and verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now, what the Hebrews writer is doing there is he's referring back to the account found in Genesis chapter 4. But it's clearly stated that Abel had a righteous standing before God. In other words, he was right with God, implying salvation was Abel's. Why? He obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. God looked at the worship that Abel offered, the manner in which Abel rendered that worship, and God says, Abel, you are right with me. Think about that. He looked to Cain, the worship he offered, the manner in which he rendered that worship, and God rejected Cain. We learn from Genesis chapter 4. And so let us not miss the big picture here, the obvious solution. Yes, the manner in which a man or woman worships God directly affects his or her salvation status, period. Hebrews 11, 4, as an inspired commentary on Genesis 4, uh, 
definitely teaches that. And now it makes sense why Jesus would say what he said to the Samaritan woman. Ye worship, ye know not what. We, we Jews, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Now that brings us to the second half of this point, and that is salvation was in that day tied to an exclusive group, the Jews. Salvation today is tied to an exclusive group, namely spiritual Israel. God's people today are still Jews, though not of a fleshly type, not of a national governmental type, but God's people today, the saved, are characterized as spiritual Israel, if you will. That is namely the church. Look with me to a, a few passages. Consider Romans chapter 2, beginning at verse 28. Paul would write, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. In Romans 2, 28 and 29, Paul was pointing out very clearly that today God's chosen people are spiritual Jews. Hence, they comprise spiritual Israel. Now let's go to another Pauline text. Look with me to Galatians chapter 6, beginning at verses 15 and 16. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, namely a new creature, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Now, for fleshly Israel, national Israel of the Old Testament, circumcision was absolutely required. Circumcision was a, an outward visible sign that, hey, this person, this person is a fleshly Jew, national Jew, if you will. But here Paul says under the New Covenant, the New Testament, our circumcision, um, as he stated in Romans 2, our circumcision is of a spiritual nature, not outward in the flesh. But here he states the rule that makes or establishes spiritual Israel today is the rule concerning a new creature. And immediately I think of 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. And so still today, salvation is tied to an exclusive group. It is tied to spiritual Israel, true Jews whose circumcision is spiritual in nature, who have been born again in Christ, they're new creatures in Christ, by virtue of their baptism into Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 27, and thereby they constitute the church, the church which belongs to Christ. That is spiritual Israel in our day and time. Salvation today is tied to that exclusive group. Now, before we leave this second major point, let me add a third consideration that I want us to think about. And that is revelation is absolutely essential to both the salvation we've discussed and also the true worship that we've been studying all during this broadcast. The revelation of God's word is absolutely essential to both. After all, think about Romans 1 and verse 16 where Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power of God 
unto salvation. James 1 and verse 21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. And so the revelation of God's word is absolutely essential to salvation. That salvation which is tied to an exclusive group, namely spiritual Israel, who have submitted to the teachings and the conditions of God's revealed word. But also this revelation, or, or the Bible, if you will, it is absolutely essential to true worship. And we're going to expand upon that now as we move into our third major point, and that is number three, true worship implies the possibility of false worship. Think about that. In this conversation with the Samaritan woman, Jesus talked about true worshipers. Well, that implies the possibility of there being false worshipers as well. So let's notice two fundamental requirements that Jesus gave regarding true worship. And by the way, obviously, these are coming right out of the Scriptures. That This is what's vital to having true worship is we've got to be taught and we've got to know the Word of God. Fundamental requirement number one, our worship, Jesus said, must be in spirit. Notice John 4 and verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit. Now, people read that, and so often they immediately think, well, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. No. And in fact, throughout this context, there's uh, not a mention of the Holy Spirit anywhere leading up to this. What Jesus was doing is he was using the word spirit in the same sense that he had used it when describing God. God is a spirit being. In other words, God is spiritual in his nature. Therefore, man's worship unto God must be spiritual in its nature. Well, what does that mean? It cannot be ritualistic. It cannot be simply formality or going through the motions, it must emanate from within. It must come sincerely from the spirit of man. Number two, another fundamental requirement for true worship is that it must be in truth. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? Well, John 17, 17 Jesus prayed, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And so it is that our worship unto God, in order to be true worship, not false worship, must be in spirit, sincerely coming from our hearts, but it also must be in truth, based upon and in compliance with the Word of God, as it teaches us to worship in truth. True worship implies the possibility of false worship. And as we've already pointed out, none of us would want to be guilty of that. We've studied today about what Jesus said about true worship. I want to thank you for tuning in and for being with me here.